Good evening, and welcome to the Centro Pro Unione. My name is Father Brian Terry. I'm the Minister General of the Franciscan Friars of the Atonement, and I'm very happy to welcome you all this evening, Rome time, to the latest in our series of conferences we offer here each year at the Centro Pro Unione. This is the last one from this year, um, but we'll keep you posted. Hope you continue to look online for what will be all the activities we have here at the Centro. I'm happy to say that the Centro is celebrating over 50 years of work here in Rome at Piazza Navona, and the Friars of the Atonement this year will be celebrating 125 years. So next year, I can guarantee there's going to be a lot more conferences, a lot more activity all over the world. Because as you know, we have the Centro Per Unione here for ecumenical and interreligious studies. We also have the Graymore Ecumenical and Interreligious Institute in New York City, which also promotes activity. So. If you have a hankering to come to New York City, come join us there. As well as at our mother house in Graymore and Garrison, New York, we'll be celebrating um, our work. We'll be in our, our places in Japan, Canada, the United States, England. Um, we'll have different ways of celebrating. We'll be kicking off our year of celebration on the 23rd of September at our mother house uh, at Graymore, where uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Welby, will be joining us to receive the Paul Watson Award and launch our year of celebration. As you may have known, our community was founded in 1898 in the Anglican tradition, the Episcopalian tradition in the United States. So we have foundation in that tradition. Um, so we're very happy to launch our beginning with the celebration with the Anglican Communion. Then 11 years later, in 1909, after the Week of Prayer for Christian Unity that was started with our founder and the Catholic Church, um, we came into full communion with the Catholic Church 11, 11 years after the foundation. So we've become Catholic since 1909. So I'm very happy to introduce the Associate Director here of the Centro Prioni, Dr. Teresa Rosa, who has been on staff here for many, many years. I won't tell you how many years she's been on staff, but she's been here guiding us in our, our work and ministry here at the Center, and she'll be introducing our speaker for this evening. Thank you very much, Father Brian. Uh, I will be very brief. Uh, I'm very glad and honored to welcome at the Centro Prunione once again Rabbi Jack Bamparat. His expertise is world known, so no need to recall all his titles and merits. His wisdom always brings precious insights and as a deeply at peace person, his lectures always create an atmosphere of friendship in knowledge. And this is the, why we are so grateful to you, Rabbi Jack, and tonight the occasion for uh, sharing and enjoying in this atmosphere um, is the reflection that he will be giving us on the decisive significance of the book of Amos for understanding the literary prophets in the Hebrew Bible. Thank you very much, Rabbi Jack. First of all, I want to thank Dr. Teresa for a splendid introduction, and of course, none of it is true. <laughs> but it's always nice to hear. It's nice to hear it, even if it's not true. But anyhow, thank you very much. And Father Brian, we go back a long way. I want you to know that he was in my Plato class at the Anselmo. Do you remember? Yeah. And it was quite an interesting class. We had a wonderful time. And so I'm glad to see him again. It's always a joy. Um, let me say that the topic that I picked, uh, I picked because even though as great a scholar as W. Robertson Smith uh, has said that Amos was the father of the prophets, and even though teachers of mine have spent many years studying uh, Amos. In fact, Morgan Stern, who was a, a professor of Bible at the Hebrew Union College, wrote a multi-volume study on the, the book of Amos. It's unfortunate that when we speak about the prophets, we speak about the prophets as if they were all sort of lumped together. 
And so it's like the rabbis. That's also what they say, the rabbis. Well, that's not really accurate because it takes away from the individuality. But then if you were to actually look at the prophets that we find in the Hebrew Bible, we have to recognize that there's something that's very, very different in fact, unique, and I would say even more than unique, I would say foundational in the book of Amos. Now, what is foundational in the book of Amos, and what makes it unique? He is the first prophet, actually, that we have a record of, of having written a book. I know that the five books of Moses are attributed to Moses, but the reality is that almost nobody believes today, unless you're a fundamentalist, that Moses wrote the five books of Moses. You know, with the documentary hypothesis of J, E, D, and P, and there's no question that Moses uh, may have written parts of it or may have uh, done some important work. Even then, uh, the, the five books of Moses, it doesn't say in the beginning, this is what Moses wrote. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was unformed and void. So you don't really get to Moses until Acts of Exodus. Now, why is it that they say that Amos was the first one to actually write a book? There were books written by specific people who were called seers. And I'm going to make a distinction between what a seer is and what a prophet is. And if you look at the last chapter or so of uh, First Chronicles, you will see that uh, there are a number of uh, God, uh, you know, uh, uh, a whole range of individuals wrote books. But all these were seers who actually worked within the context of kings. In other words, they were in the employ of kings. And my own interpretation of the Bible, and unfortunately I have no evidence, or this is a hypothesis, that the Bible consists of different structures. You have a tradition which is the priestly tradition, you have a tradition which is the monarchical tradition, and you have a tradition which is the prophetic tradition. And while there are certain parallels and while there are certain similarities, and even in some cases you have identical texts in different of these, the reality is their perspective is very different, okay? Now, what Amos did is actually go to the north. He was from the south. He goes to the north because uh, he has an experience that is overwhelming, absolutely overwhelming. And if you want to have a sense of that experience, let me uh, just read it to you so you'll see. It's in the third chapter of, of the book of Amos, and he says, Do two walk together unless they've made an appointment? And the answer is no. Does a lion roar in the forest when he has no prey? Does a young lion cry out from his den if he has taken nothing? Does a bird fall in a snare on the earth when there's no trap for it? This is a cause and effect relationship, right? Does a, does a snare spring up from the ground when it has taken nothing? Does a trumpet blow in a city and the people are not afraid? Keep in mind when they used to blow a trumpet from the walls, it meant that there was an invader. And then he said something very interesting. Does evil befall a city unless the Lord has done it? Namely, does punishment take place unless it's God that does it? And then he says, surely the Lord God does nothing without revealing his secret to his servants the prophets. Now here's the rub. He continues, the lion has roared. Keep in mind, a lion wouldn't roar unless he's got you, you know, really grasped and you can't uh, exit. The lion has roared, who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken, who can but prophesy? 
and you see what you get when you see uh, the prophets, the one thing you get is this reluctance on the part of a prophet to be a prophet. It's almost like they have to be overpowered to be a prophet. Even Moses, if you remember, he sees this bush that's burning and he goes, wonders what it is, and he says, take the shoes from off your feet because the land on which you're staring is holy ground. I've heard the cry of the Israelites, go to Egypt and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And what does Moses say? After this enormous religious experience of a bush, a miracle, and so forth, the first thing he says is, who am I? And then he says, and who are you? And, you know, and he says, look, I can't talk. <laughs> and then he says, send somebody else. So much for prophecy. The prophets in the Bible are not that eager to be prophets. And perhaps the best and most explicit example of that is in the prophet Jeremiah. In the 20th chapter of Jeremiah, he says something that is unique to the prophets, but very similar to what Amos says. And here, Amos is the first, really, to say that the experience of an individual with God is an overpowering experience, so much so that he cannot help but respond to it. So Jeremiah in the 20th chapter, after being told in the first chapter that go where I send you and I'm going to give you the strength to confront the worst, what does he say in the 20th chapter? He says, O oh Lord, you've deceived me. I was deceived. You are stronger than I. You have prevailed. I've become a laughing stock all the day. Everyone mocks me, for whenever I speak, I cry out. I shout violence and destruction, for the word of the Lord has become for me a reproach and derision all day long. If I say I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, there is in my heart, as it were, a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I am weary with holding it in, and I cannot. So a prophet is actually someone who's been selected by God, in some respects overpowered by God, so that that individual doesn't have really the capacity to resist this overpowering and must do what God asks him to do. I hope that that's clear. You see this for the first time in the prophet Amos. Now, you then ask, I must ask the question, what is the difference between a prophet and a seer? What is a seer? And what is a prophet? In some respects, it was relatively confusing what the real difference between a prophet and a seer. But I can tell you that a seer is someone who sees the future. Uh, he thinks he may even see it correctly. Okay, But the main point of a seer is to somehow say, through whatever mechanisms I develop, it may be dreams, it may be incantations, it may be uh, in a kind of an unconscious development. Uh, in fact, in Numbers 12, it says if there's a seer, it can come in a dream, it come, but only Moses understood it face to face, saw God face to face. But a seer is someone who actually says, this is God's word, and this is what's going to take place. Now, there's a big difference, as I will now point out to you, in the, and it is Amos who actually is the first one to make the difference between a seer and a prophet. He goes to Amaziah, who is the priest of Bethel. This is the seventh chapter of Amos. And when he goes to Amaziah, he basically says uh, that, that the country is going to be destroyed. This is the prediction, that the northern kingdom, which is the kingdom of Jeroboam II, is going to be destroyed because of the corruption, the corruption of that government. Now, nobody believes it. Why does nobody believe it? Because Jeroboam, if you look at the Second Kings chapter 14, 25, chapter 14, verse 25, 
the prophet Jonah predicts that Jeroboam is going to conquer all this territory and become very, very famous. And everybody thinks, isn't this wonderful that we've won all these wars and so forth? Whereas what does Amos say? Amos goes and when he confronts um, Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, here's what he says. Let me quote it to you. He says, that Jeremiah is going to, well, let me tell you first what, what Amaziah says to him in response to what Amos said, beginning with the 10th verse. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to Jeroboam, king of Israel, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from its land. And Amaziah then turns to Amos and says, O seer, go flee, and go back to the land of Judah, and eat your bread there, and prophesy there, but never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary, and it is a temple of the kingdom. And what does Amos say? Amos responds by saying, I am not a prophet, nor am I a prophet's son. I am a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore trees, but the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go prophesy to my people Israel. Now therefore hear the word of the Lord. Now look, he says that the way God took him is equivalent to a lion roaring and being afraid. What Amaziah sees him is strictly as a person who predicts the future. And if you're going to be one of these guild prophets, that your job is to be associated with either the king or a sanctuary or something like that, well then fine, predict the future there, but don't come here. This isn't, this isn't your place. This is not where you belong. Because in those days, actually, seers were associated with specific kings. For example, David had Nathan, right? Uh, Ahab had Elijah. You had specific uh, prophets who were primarily telling the future. And in telling the future, they actually said, this is what's going to happen. Now, hold on now, hold on now. What does Amos say? Amos also tells the future. He says the, the, the land is going to be destroyed. Jeroboam is going to go under. He's going to be killed and so forth. So what, how, is he, how is he different? He is different in two senses. He is different in the sense that all those people that predicted that something would take place are seers. Amos is not simply interested in predicting what will take place but he does something for the first time that all the other prophets do. And that is, he goes to the people and asks the people to change. And perhaps if they change, then perhaps God will change. You see, before that, look at all the places where you had individuals intercede with God. What did they do? When Abraham is told, I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, does he go to Sodom and Gomorrah and say to Sodom and Gomorrah, change your ways, don't be so evil, you know, become a, a, a good person and things of that nature? No. He intercedes with God. He says, are you the kind of a God that would destroy the righteous with the wicked? If there are 60, would you still destroy it? If there are 40 or 50 or not 60, 50, or 40, or 30, or 20, or 10. Do you remember that? Or even with Moses, when Moses is told after the, uh, the spies go to spy out the land, and they come back saying it's hopeless, we'll never conquer the land, and, and God says, this is in Numbers 14, uh, I'm going to destroy this people and make a great nation out of you, Moses. So what does Moses do? He's being stoned, he and Joshua, by the people. He says, wait a minute. God. Didn't you promise that you would take them out of Egypt and bring them into the promised land? Are you the kind of God that keeps his promises or not? 
And God says, okay. And then he says another thing that's interesting. Have you, you yourself said, here he's quoting himself in Exodus uh, 33 and 34, it says, aren't you a God that is rachum v'chanun, erkapayim v'rav kassid v'et, compassionate and, and, and gracious, full of steadfast love. And he says, you've taught us that it's easy to destroy. The main thing is to forgive. So, a seer tells what's going to happen. And if it happens, the seer is a good seer because he's right. If it doesn't happen, it's a disgrace. Don't you see that? And this is my job. My job is to be a seer, to tell you what's going to take place. And if it doesn't take place, it means I'm a fraud or I didn't get it right or I'm, I'm not good at my job, right? But the interesting thing is there's a book, the whole book, one of the 12 prophets, that actually is devoted to just that thing. Do you remember when uh, God says to Jonah, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach against that city and say, if you look at the Septuagint, it's three days. If you look at the Hebrew, it's 40 days, and the nation will be destroyed. So what do they do? They sit in, the, in, in they get wrap themselves, you know, in sackcloth and ashes, and, and you know, they, they repent. So what happens to uh, Jonah? Is Jonah happy that all these people have repented? On the contrary, Jonah's furious. Why is he furious? Because who's going to consult him anymore? Who's going to go to him anymore if it turns out that he's wrong? In fact, God says in the last chapter of Jonah, do you have a right to be angry? After all, look at these people. Not only that, they're animals. Is that really what you want? So what you have in the book of Jonah, this is my interpretation. Then you have to, if I'm wrong, you're going to have to blame me for it. I've never seen it anywhere. I see the book of Jonah as the book of a seer from the perspective of a prophet. Why? Because the first thing that Amos does and what the prophets do is they go to the people and they say to the people, you have a choice. You could either go one way or you can go the other way. If you go one way, then you will survive and God will care for you. If you go the other way, then you will be destroyed. Amos is the very first person to do that. Now, what does Jonah say, and to underline the point I was making, to God when the people aren't destroyed? I know the kind of a God you were. Why do you think I, I went to Tarshish instead of Nineveh? If I went to Nineveh, you know, I would know what would happen. You're a pushover. You're an ale rachum v'chanun er kapayim v'rav chesed v'emet. You are a compassionate God. So what's the point of telling me that this city will be destroyed when you had no real intention of destroying it? It's inconceivable to Jonah that the people could repent. Now the greatness of Amos is that Amos actually says that. What he does, if you look at the fifth chapter, which is an incredibly important chapter, beginning with the fourth verse, it says, For thus says the Lord to the house of Israel, Seek me and live, but do not seek Bethel, which is where the sacrifices were, and do not enter into Gilgal, and so forth. And then he says, Seek good and not evil that you may live, so the Lord, the God of hosts, will be with you, as you have said, hate evil, love good, establish justice in the gate. It may be, Ulai, perhaps it may be, that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. Here is the great innovation of Amos. He is the first prophet to actually confront the people and say to the people, you have a choice. It isn't in the stars, it's not in the heavens, it's not, it's something that you have the control over your destiny. And if you do good, you will survive. If you do evil, you will suffer.
Now, there was a problem with that. What is the problem with that? The problem with that is that for Amos and the other prophets, this, and here I'm, I'm going to give you the punchline, what I'm going to end with, but I might as well tell it to you now so you'll see where I'm going, okay? What the prophets are saying, Amos is the first one and the others have taken it over, is that morality is the way to God. God is a moral deity. And to wait to get to God is through acting ethically, through justice and righteousness. You don't get to God through sacrifices. And so what you have, beginning with Amos, in the most severe possible form, is the rejection of sacrifice. Now here I'm treading on very controversial territory. Why? Because being persuaded by the teachers of my teachers and my teachers, uh, Binswanger was the teacher of Sheldon Blank. Sheldon Blank was my teacher, both illustrious uh, biblical scholars. They said that the prophets were categorically against sacrifice. Now, you have some scholars who say, no, if they acted morally, they could still sacrifice. That one doesn't exclude the other. But the reality is, if you look at what they say about sacrifice, you will see that they categorically reject sacrifice. You can't take the words of Amos. Let me start with Amos, where he says, I hate, I despise your feasts. And I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and cereal offerings, I will not accept them. And the peace offerings of your fatted beast, I will not look upon. Take away from me the noise of your songs. To the melody of your harps, I will not listen. I don't want any of this. And then he says, the first one to say this, the very first one to say it, and you'll see the other prophets in a minute, I'll show you, follow suit. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. So what Amos is doing is contrasting the way you approach God. You approach God with morality, not with sacrifice. I mean, you see this very clearly in Isaiah, you see it in Hosea, you see it in Jeremiah. In every one of these prophets, what you see is a condemnation of sacrifice. The only one which is a little bit questionable is Ezekiel, and that's a special case in itself, okay? But Ezekiel, by the way, is very wooden. If you look at the Hebrew, of Amos, uh, it is magnificent, it's sharp, it's clear, it's decisive. There's no Hebrew in the world like that of Isaiah. It's worth learning Hebrew just to read Isaiah. I mean, it's just, it's, it's like saying you have to learn Italian to read Dante. It's the same thing. I mean, it's just an amazing thing. So what I'm saying is that it's morality that takes the place of sacrifice, of morality, of sorcerers, of diviners, and so forth. And you see this everywhere you turn. Now, let me tell you now the difference between seerdom and prophecy, okay? Seerdom is where the seer is told what's going to happen. It could be that the seer or someone may intervene with God and say, please God, forgive them for doing this. And it's up to God whether God will forgive them or not. Okay? Prophecy is where you don't actually, uh, you appeal to God, but if appealing to God doesn't actually work, then what you do is you appeal to human beings. 
So the first thing that Amos did when he was told what's going to happen, if you look at the seventh chapter, it says, Thus the Lord God showed me. Behold, he was forming locusts in the beginning of the shooting up of the latter growth. And lo, it was the latter growth after the king's growings. When they had finished eating the grass of the land, I said, O Lord God, forgive, I beseech thee. How can Jacob stand? He is so small. The Lord repenteth. And then the God showed me and was calling for judgment by fire. And it devoured everything. I said, oh God, how, how, can, how can Jacob stand, he says. And the Lord repented concerning this. Also this shall not be. And then he showed me, behold, the Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I set a plumb line. And then the Lord said, Behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people. I will never again pass by them. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate. The sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. So what Amos decided to do, since there was no way of getting God to do anything except to actually have a plumb line to distinguish between those who were just and those who weren't, to then go to the people, which is exactly what the other prophets did. You see? Let me take a, a very good and wonderful example of that. Let's look at Isaiah, the very first chapter of Isaiah. And I must say to you, you can't read Isaiah without holding your breath. It is so fantastic. It is so magnificent. I consider the greatest religious book that's ever been written is the book of Job. But Job is basically unreadable. In fact, um, um, it, was, it was Knoll who told me um, that uh, even in, in rabbinic times, they would read Job in Aramaic because the Hebrew was so difficult. Because there were so many hapax legomenas in Job. Do you know what a hapax legomena is? Hmm? In other words, words that were only used once and never used in any other place. So, so no one knows what they mean. But if you look at Isaiah, I mean, it, it, it's absolutely amazing. Let me read to you what Isaiah says here. Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, sons who deal corruptly. They have forsaken the Lord, they have spies, the Holy One of Israel. They are utterly estranged. Why will you still be smitten that you continue to rebel? And then he describes how sick and desolate the whole thing is. But then he changes, because you see, they were saying, look, why should God be angry with us? Look at all the sacrifices that we're offering on a daily basis in the temple, in the altars. We're constantly sacrificing to God. And these, this is the way we connect to God, through the sacrifices. There was one fundamental problem with the sacrifices. I'll go into it in more detail later. Um, that the priests who were doing the sacrifices were corrupt. They took bribes. They sided with the rich. And uh, it was no longer an issue of whether the priests had any integrity or not. They, they didn't have any integrity, you see. And so what he says is, what is, what to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord? I have enough of burnt offerings of rams, of the fat of fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of he goats. When you come to appear before me, who requires of you this trampling of my courts? Bring no more totally useless offerings. You see, vain, they, the, 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 the English translation here is not a good translation. Uh, shav. It's the same word that you find in the third commandment. Don't lift up the name of the Lord your God, la shav, which means for something that's totally useless. So don't offer me vain offerings would mean, the implication in English would be, this is a vain offering, but if you have a non-vain offering, then it might be accepted. It's not true. 
In other words, don't come up with any of these useless offerings. Um, incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and the calling of assemblies. I cannot endure iniquity with solemn assembly. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates. They become a burden to me. I'm weary of bearing them. When you spread your hands, when you spread forth your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your doings. The evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Correct oppression. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. You see this appeal, seek good and not evil. You see, correct oppression. And then it actually shows that the problem with sacrifices, apart from their being totally useless, another problem with the sacrifices is that it gives people a false confidence. They see if they sacrifice, then all of a sudden it'll mean that everything is going to be just fine. They're doing the sacrifice. The one person that really hits that but very hard, following upon Amos, is Jeremiah. Now, what does Jeremiah in the seventh chapter say? Uh, here again, we have a, a Hebrew that's incredible. It's absolutely magnificent. What he says in the seventh chapter, which was called the Temple Sermon, and it's this sermon that put, put, gets him into trouble. He says, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim there the word and say, hear the word of the Lord, all you men of Judah, who enter these gates to worship the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your doings, and I will let you dwell in this place. You see here the very same approach that you had in Isaiah, cease to do evil, learn to do good. When Amos says, see good and not evil that you may live, right? Here would uh, Jeremiah say, um, um, amend your ways and your doings and I will let you dwell in this place. Do not trust in these deceptive words. This is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. You might say, why is he repeating it three times? And the guess here is that there were three different, there was three different buildings, the temple of the Lord was vast. And so he's, it's as if he were to turn here, and then here, and then here. And then he says, if, for if you truly amend your ways and your doings, if you truly execute justice one with another, if you do not oppress the alien, the fatherless, or the widow, or shed innocent blood in this place, and if you do not go after other gods to your own earth, then I will let you dwell in this place, in the land that I gave to your fathers. Behold, you trust in deceptive words to no avail. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, burn incense to Baal, and go after other gods that you have not known, and then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say we're delivered, and only to go on doing all these abominations. Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes. Now, to say that the temple is going to be destroyed is the equivalent of saying that what everybody thought was the way in which human beings are connected to God is no longer going to be possible. Well, hello, how can that happen? The prophets are saying the following. 
A, your entire sacrificial cult is useless. Two, they're saying the national existence will be, will be simply destroyed. You will no longer have. So what is uncanny is that, that it's, it's unimaginable that a prophet speaking in God's name should say that the main way in which they approach God will no longer exist and that the nation, which after all was considered the nation that was chosen, right? That the chosen people and the chosen nation should be completely and absolutely destroyed. Does that make any sense? Well, it's interesting that if you look at the third chapter of Amos, here we go again. As I say, Amos is the foundation for all these fundamental categories. Uh, in the very first verse of the... Um, well, the second verse, really, but it says, Hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O people of Israel, against the whole family which I brought out of the land of Egypt. You only have I known of all the families of the earth. By the way, the word yada, which is, is translating here as known, uh, the Jerusalem Bible has a somewhat more intimate translation. It says cared for. You only have I cared for. Yada in Hebrew can mean a lot of different things, but it means a very close relationship, actually. You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. In other words, it's a whole new concept of chosenness. To be chosen is to somehow stand for God in a godless world. To be chosen is to stand for the morality that God demands of all human beings. That's what chosenness means. It doesn't mean privilege. It doesn't mean special. And here you have, for the first time in Amos, this whole new conception of chosenness. You see the point I'm making? And once you see that, then you see that, um, that this is a very different sort of thing. Now, what is the problem with actually having uh, a priesthood that uh, does these sacrifices? Uh, well, the problem is that the priesthood, as it were, cannot get the people to change. They may come with an offering, and when they give the offering, they may feel better as a result, but then again, that is subject to all kinds of graft. Because if you have a lot of money, then your offering is much different than if you don't have much money. And the priests themselves take bribes, just as the judges take bribes. And so the reality is you have a totally corrupt system. When Amos says about the sins of Israel, he says the following in the, in the second chapter. He says, For three transgressions of Israel and for four, I will not revoke the punishment, because they sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of shoes. They trample the head of the poor into the dust of the earth and turn aside the way of the afflicted so that my holy name is profaned. They lay themselves beside every altar upon garments taken in pledge, and in the house of their God they drink the wine of those who have been fined. He says it as clearly as can be over and over again. If you look at this magnificent passage in, uh, in the sixth chapter, um, well, let's, do, let's take the fifth chapter first, and then we're going to get to the sixth chapter. They hate him who reproves in the gate, and they abhor him who speaks the truth. Therefore, because you trample upon the poor and take from him exactions of wheat, you have built houses of hewn stone, but you shall not dwell in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink their wine. For I know how many are your transgressions and how great are your sins. You who afflict the righteous, who take a bribe and turn aside the needy in the gate, 
Therefore, he who is prudent will keep silent in such a time, for it is an evil time. Or take what he says in the sixth chapter. Woe to those who lie upon beds of ivory and stretch themselves upon their couches and eat lambs from the flock and calves from the midst of the stall, who sing idle songs to the sound of the harp and like David, invent for themselves instrument of music, who drink wine in bowls and anoint themselves with the finest oils, but are not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. Now, who was Joseph? Joseph was that brother that was left into a pit to die and then was sold into slavery. Now, here is what I think is the greatest achievement of Amos. Before Amos, a nation would go into exile or a nation would be destroyed if they engaged in idolatry, if they worshiped the gods of the people around. Why? Because to worship the gods of the people around is to engage in the most detestable, detestable activities, including child sacrifice. This was very common. Or what it was called Kadeshot, which are ritual prostitution, where they would have these uh, actual acting out of all kinds of sexual acts to, because you were in a, you're in a Canaanite environment. You're in an environment uh, uh, where you need crops. And so when they moved into the land of Canaan, the, for the first time they were they were actually threatened with the gods of agriculture. And so there was a question, if you don't abide by these gods of agriculture, there may be some. In fact, it was Hosea who says, it's God that gives you this, not these pagan deities, you see. But the greatest contribution of Amos, which the other prophets actually reciprocate and, and build on, is that it's not idolatry alone that causes for the destruction of the nation, but injustice. Namely, social justice is more important than anything else. And if you have a society that's built on exploiting the poor and the needy and the homeless and the stranger and the widow and the orphan, if you have a society that's only interested in luxury, he has this wonderful passage condemning these women who want to drink and they want to get their husbands to give them all that. He says, hear this word, you cows of Bashan, who are in the mountain of Samaria, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to their husbands, bring that we may drink. The Lord God has sworn by his holiness that behold, the days are coming upon you when they shall take you away with hooks, even the last of you with fish hooks, and you shall go out through the breaches, everyone straight before him, and you shall be cast, cast forth into Harmon. He completely condemns the upper classes. Now, who are the upper classes? Those who take bribes, and who are the ones that take bribes? The judges. In the second chapter, he says, they sell the righteous for silver, the needy for a pair of shoes, and so forth. I had quoted that. You have similar statements, by the way, in Isaiah. You have similar statements in Jeremiah. You have similar statements in other passages in the prophets. But I think what you have here in Amos is the foundation for a new way of looking at the world, a new understanding of God's relationship to human beings. Now, what is the problem here? The problem here is, and this you see clearly in the Psalms, why is it that the Bible produced a book of Psalms where you have an immediate relationship between the individual and God? And notice in Psalm 51 it says, uh, the sacrifices of God to God are a broken heart, a broken and contrite heart that will not despise. What you have in throughout the Bible now is something different. 
You would never have had Psalms unless you had the belief that one as an individual can communicate one to one with God. So that, for example, prayer is something that came out of prophecy. Prayer in the sense that the God of the universe, the God of this spectacular universe, and if you want to see this, look at Job and look at the voice out of the whirlwind in the last chapters of Job to see the conception of the vastness of the universe. But in prayer, the God of the universe becomes my God, that I can connect with God. And connecting with God, what do I do? I bear my soul. Because where else am I able to bear my soul and to tell the truth? Am I going to say it to somebody, even someone who's very close to me? There are things that I can't. So I have to have a God who hears prayer, a God who cares, a God who's concerned with the way I live my life, a God who takes seriously the world that I can create for the good of all. And this, in my opinion, is basically rooted in monotheism. Why is it rooted in monotheism? Because, see, the problem with the, uh, the gods of the nations is that the gods of the nations were very local. They had city deities, national deities. Uh, the Babylonian had astral deities. The Egyptians had the sun. You have, for example, in Deuteronomy, a very interesting passage that says, when you look up at the sky, don't be enticed by the sun and the moon, because that's for the others, not for you. God took you from the fiery furnace, finally. Why do you think that the Bible and the prophets are so concerned with being the only alternative that I've ever been able to see? to power, to power, power. You know, Thucydides said in this magnificent Melian dialogue, the strong do what they want and the weak suffer what they must. If you're strong, you decide what's right and wrong. If you're strong, you decide what's true and false. If you're strong, you get away with anything you want. If you're strong, you can create as many armaments as you want and use those armaments in war. Because keep in mind, in the ancient world, there was nothing but scarcity. And so what people had to do, literally, what people had to do was to empower the so-called manly virtues of strength and power. For example, in the Iliad, having pity is a vice. Having compassion is a vice. The real uh, virtues are the virtues of strength. Because why? The virtues of war. Even someone like Aristotle says in the politics, the best thing of a person to do is to die in, 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 in a war for his city. Now, what do you do when you have a totally different view? A view that says your prime concern is with the widow, the stranger, the orphan, the poor, the needy. So that's why, for example, the whole of the Bible goes back to the exodus from Egypt. You know, Nietzsche once said that the Bible is a slave morality. And he felt that was horrible, that why should we be paying attention to people who are needy and crippled and, and, and incapable of taking care of themselves, who need a cane like we do, you see. It's the hero, it's the strong man, that's who should determine the virtues. My feeling is it's because of the slave ethic that you have such things as the Sabbath, where one day a week, Every human being has control over his and her life. And therefore, the master and the slave are on the same footing. Where else do you have an ethic that says that equality is not among a class? Equality is when you bring up the poor on your level. What I'm saying is 
that what the prophets are embodying is the the reality of coming out of slavery. And that's why it says, love the stranger. Why? Because you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. God is a God who wants freedom. God is a God who's against slavery. God is a God who's against oppression. God is a God against taking advantage of another person and boasting about all the wrong things. Amos is the one who really laid the foundation for this. And I hope in time you'll be able to read the prophets. I've just skimmed the surface. I could go on for another hour. But I don't want to impose too much on you. I will impose on my students next Wednesday where I will deal with this in much greater detail. But uh, anyhow, thank you very much for allowing to... So now Jack has uh, offered a bit of time now to reflect a bit on what he has said. And if you have some questions or you'd like to uh, prompt maybe some more reflection on certain areas. I mean, I found it extremely motivating to understand the difference between seers and prophets. Hearing the words of the prophets today, I wish uh, Amos could come and speak to some world leaders when we see <laughs> right. the injustice we're living today and yeah. reorient us to this morality in our relationship with God and to seek, um, especially coming from Franciscan perspective, we know it's seeking the minority and the simpleness before our God. <gasps> And justice and peacemaking is something we strive for. But I was absolutely motivated today. I'm going to go home and read Amos all over again. And, um, <laughs> unfortunately, um, I remember one thing you said to us when you were in class. You were saying, um, I don't care if you steal whatever I do and say that it's yours. Don't say that something yours is something that I said. Yeah. So I've taken that to heart. So I'm stealing everything he said today. I'm glad it's <laughs> on okay. tape. It'll be in a homily That's sometime. Okay. That's fine. That's fine. So does anyone have a question or a reflection? And we also have the opportunity online if people would like to send something in. Uh, Neto, our um, web uh, coordinator, will bring forward a question if someone wants to submit something online. Does anyone have a question or comment at this time? We'll spend a few moments doing this. Thank you, Rabbi Jack, for this really amazing talk. Thank you. Um, I, just, I don't have a question because um, I want to take some uh, thoughts with me to reflect upon what you ended on. But what came to mind as you were uh, talking is uh, when you were talking about sacrifice and how morality takes place uh, of, of sacrifice, this um, Quranic verse came to mind, and I just wanted to share that with you, um, which, in in my opinion, brings uh, brings in some miraculous way this this um, these both together. So in Surah Al Hajj. Verse 37, it says, God says, Their meat will not reach God, nor will their blood, but what reaches him is piety from you. Thus have we subjected them to you, that you may glorify God for that to which he has guided you, and give, give good tidings to the doers of good. Yeah. So it's, it's not that any of... Uh, it, it really, I think, echoes some... Of the passages you had, you have read from uh, Isaiah, and how the sacrifice itself becomes an act of piety instead of yes. um, um, something else. I thank you. I appreciate that. I think that uh, one of the verses that I like very much uh, from the Qur the Quran is uh, that religion should compete in virtue. And also there's a statement in the Mishnah, I think you know, that it says, he who saves one life, it's as if he saved an entire world. And he who destroys one life, it's as if he destroyed an entire world. So that every life is precious. And so therefore we, we have a certain obligation, it seems to me, uh, to respect that, to respect the integrity of every human being. And I think what actually is what religion should do today. I've said this to you in class, 
that religion has to become the conscience of society and the voice of humanity, the voice for humanity. Because you're not going to get it from the weapons manufacturers. You're not going to get it from the politicians. And if the religions of the world don't unite to really work and seek peace, you have, for example, in the Bible, seek peace and pursue it. You know, we have to do what we can to bring about peace. And But the courage that the prophets had to confront the most powerful, without armies, without a union, without anything, as individuals, only in the name of God. And this is beautiful in the 26th chapter of Jeremiah when he's almost put to death. And he says, of a truth, God told me to say this to you. You can kill me, but that's not going to change the fact that this is what God told me to say to you. Because God is a God of morality. You even have it, for example, in the 58th chapter of Isaiah, which was the passage that we read on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. It says, is this the fast that I have chosen? To, you know, to bow down and to uh, scrape and so on. No. The fast that I have chosen is to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, and free the captives, and don't hide yourself from your own flesh. And it's interesting, Hermann Cohn has a comment on that, where he says, it's not just the wife that is your flesh, every human being is your flesh. And if you see other human beings in need, don't hide yourself from their needs. Because you can only, look, you can only come to a certain sense of who you are in relationship to others. And it's, so my feeling is one what should do is bring about the best in oneself and everyone else. And uh, this is what life is all about. I see a slight tension between your interpretation of Job in which you say, it's up to man to create justice, that God has created the heavens, the earth, and he tends to... And inspire human beings to do it. Right. And yet, those who are just are trampled down by those who are powerful. I mean, you just said it. You quoted Thucydides. So how do you, how do you reconcile the two? In other words, God isn't just going to come down and say, oh, you, this group over here is really righteous and good and they take care of the poor and the needy, so I'm going to spare them and I'm going to smite everybody else. It doesn't work like that. Well, I think that this choice that you have, which is essentially what I think Amos and the prophets are saying, is you have a choice as to whether you're going to make this world a world that is a joy to live in, a joy of caring for one another, a joy of bringing out the best in each other, or you may actually uh, act in such a way as to bring about the worst. I haven't already determined what that's going to be. That's why we're thinking about revelation, right? So God reveals uh, a, a word which says, this is what you should be doing. But God can't do it for you. I mean, I'm reminded of, uh, of what it says, uh, Micah, the very last chapter of Micah, I was going to quote it, but it's this, I went on and on and on. It was a little too long. But if you look, here's one possibility, okay? It says, uh, Woe is me, for I have become as when the summer fruit has been gathered, as when the vintage has been gleaned. There's no cluster to eat, no first ripe fig which my soul desires. The godly man has perished from the earth. And there's none upright among men. They all lie in wait for blood, and each hunts his brother with a net. Their hands are upon what is evil to do it diligently. The prince and the judge ask for a bribe, and the great man utters the evil desire of his soul. Thus they weave it together. The best of them is like a briar, 
the most upright of them, a thorn hedge. The day of their watchmen, of their punishment, has come. Now their confusion is at hand. Put no trust in a neighbor. Have no confidence in a friend. Guard the doors of your mouth from her who lies in your bosom. For the son treats the father with contempt, and the daughter rises up against her mother. The daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the men of his own house. I would say that to some extent a lot of this has already happened in the United States where you have people who won't talk to each other even though they're in the same house because they look at it. And, and this isn't just um, Micah, you have the same thing in Isaiah, you have the same thing in Jeremiah. So what actually when it says, I've said before you, this is Deuteronomy, life and death, the blessing and the curse, Choose life so that you and your children may live. But there's no way that that choice um, cannot be offered. And now, let hear Josiah Royce, I think, put it very well. He says, this is the kind of a universe in which a moral individual is allowed and given the opportunity to act morally. And look, let me give you an example, okay? Should God intercede, where, assuming that God could intercede, that's a whole theological question. Should God intercede every time something may happen that's not correct or not right or anything like that? And where do you draw the line? If God makes all the decisions, then we make no decisions. Even Thomas Aquinas said what God, what God does is gives the outline of the general patterns, but within that outline, individuals truths, you see. Uh, otherwise, it means that why, why can't, why, I never could ride a bicycle too well. Why didn't God uh, ride the bicycle for me so that I could ride a bicycle? You know, it doesn't work. We have an online question that Teresa is going to read. So we have two online questions. Uh, the first is from uh, Sister Josmi Jose. I would like to thank Rabbi Jack for his inspiring lecture. Just now, we have completed the classes on the first chapters of Isaiah. Today, it was a complimentary one. I would like to ask if he can deepen on the social context of Amos and its significance today. Thank you. Well, the second question is from Fra Giacomo. <laughs> And he said, thank you, Rabbi Jack, for your always profound and reflective presentation. The question that I would ask is this. Amos is establishing a new and demanding relationship with God. He goes to the people to plead them collectively to establish this relationship. I would ask, how does what he says needs to be established among the people in, in the way they are to act with each other? In a certain way, this is what Jesus asks when he teaches the Beatitudes as a way of conquering the spirit of the world or the masses in their relationship among themselves. What do you think about this aspect of not reading Amos but leaving Amos? Thank you. Well, the question for today, I can't think of anything that's more important than Amos and the prophets because what the prophets do is deal with people who are arrogant, who are boastful, who feel that they have everything under their control and have nothing but contempt for the poor, the needy. In other words, it becomes uh, uh, a world where the most, thing, the most important thing is profit, not people. And if you only pursue profit and not people, and here Amos, Amos is the first in a line which then is ultimately represented in the Torah, in the five books of Moses, etc., which offer an alternative. You have all kinds of structures by which this is the way you organize the world and you organize your life. Now, the second question, I must say, I had a little difficulty understanding it. Could you explain it to me? Um, in the Beatitudes that Jesus talks about um, living the morality so it's, I think it's a parallel of what he's saying, the, the ten Beatitudes, blessed are the poor, and the, those kinds of ways of responding um, to those people through action as opposed to, I think as you were, you were contrasting very, very well the, 
the, the object nature of a sacrifice, of being something that's totally disconnected from me, from what would be a, maybe a, what I was thinking earlier, a spiritual sacrifice of, of making, uh, making room for the poor, making that, that sensitivity. So I think uh, Father Jim was drawing uh, alignment with those scripture passages that uh, Jesus had spoken about. He well, came up I with those, that, those things. Well, you know, I, I think, you know, I don't know if I gave it here, uh, Brian, but I gave a talk on Jesus as a teacher of Judaism, mm -hmm. where what I try to do is to show that essentially what Jesus is teaching is actually Judaism. Mm -hmm. The very fact when they go to him and say, good teacher, mm -hmm. you know, how do I get to immortality? And he says, there's no one good but God. Mm -hmm. Do the commandments. He said, oh, I've done those, as if anyone can really do the commandments. And he said, all right, then sell everything you have and give to the poor. That I can't do. Mm. There's always something that stands in the way. Now, what Jesus is saying is take a good look at what is, in your eyes, stands in the way and deal with that. But I do think that, uh, uh, um, remember when I gave the talk here on violence, mm. I was severely criticized for that. Now, why was I severely criticized? Because I concluded that talk with a quote from the New Testament. So many rabbis say, you don't, you don't have enough verses in the Hebrew Bible <laughs> that you have to quote the New Testament. But what I was quoting is, you know, um, render unto God that which is God, right? And to uh, Caesar what is Caesar's. And what I said is, don't get confused. Don't think that you're rendering to God what you're really rendering to Caesar. <laughs> Because you may end up getting all confused unless you know the difference. You see, now you're, that's essentially what I think Je the best in Jesus is an attempt to do that. Um, now, part of the problem that I have in reading the New Testament is that uh, it has to be read critically. It has to be read uh, uh, contextually, and it has to be seen in the context, and it's unfortunate that what they do is they will abstract the statement as if it applies to everyone everywhere, where it doesn't. It applies to a very specific instance or a very specific case. I mean, uh, Joseph Seaver spent a lot of time and came out with a very good book on the Pharisees. You see? Now, the text itself, the mission itself talks about eight kinds of Pharisees. Only one was decent. All the others were terrible. So who knows which Pharisees Jesus was referring to in the 23rd chapter of Matthew. But what's even more problematic is that in other places, Jesus is referred to as a teacher, whereas in Matthew 23, he's referred to as a rabbi. Now, what's the problem with that? The problem with that is that the title rabbi didn't come into existence until after the destruction of the temple. It's the equivalent, for example, if I were to say, this is a book that came out in 1950, and I went to the airport, and it turns out that when I got to Kennedy Airport, uh, I couldn't find a space to park. Well, there wasn't any Kennedy Airport until after Kennedy was killed. <laughs> but they were writing for a group of people where if you would have said, uh, uh, another name, you know, like Idlewild, they wouldn't know what you're talking about. So therefore, they said, Rabbi. You see what I'm saying? So you have to actually see, or, or, or for example, the Hag Hamatzot is before the destruction of the temple. The whole issue of the combining of Passover with the Hag Hamatzot took place after the destruction of the temple. And that's one of the reasons that there was a difference between the Synoptic Gospels and John. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that one has to look at these things historically and contextually. Sure. Now, there's a very good book um, by Willie Marks and called The New Testament as the Church's Book. What's good about him is that he tries to show to what extent the church tried to reorganize the New Testament in a way that would be, and this is problematic because it may be, for example, Irenaeus in his Against Heresies says, I have two Gospels of Matthew. I have the uh, Aramaic and I have the Greek. The Aramaic is much better, much more accurate. We don't have the Aramaic. We only have the Greek. 
So I think these are some of the things that one has to really take a look at, you see. Sure. No, I think we believe in strong structural criticism for the phenomenological hermeneutics. We know that there's been a lot of editing over time, as you were talking about the books of Moses. Exactly. It's the same exactly. thing. Exactly. That, That's exactly right. That's yes. my point. Yes. Exactly. And Thank then you, you get that poor monk that was copying things over and over and went to lunch and came back and skipped three lines and <laughs> kind of messed things up for our scriptures. We no, look, you have, you look, when it comes to the New Testament, you have over 5,000 different copies that have, no two are identical. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, there's very severe differences. Right. The problem with the New Testament is that the Greek is very difficult. And the reason it's difficult is because it's a colloquial Greek. It's a, it's a Greek that um, you can interpret it a lot of different ways. It's like a spoken language. It right. doesn't have the precision of other languages, like, the, like ancient Greek, for example. But take even Pontius Pilate. We know if, you, if Eusebius is correct, Eusebius in his history says that both Caiaphas and Pontius Pilate were brought back to Rome because of cruelty by Caligula. Now, if you've got one emperor that was cruel, it's Caligula. And so why would they do that? You know, if you look at the... Uh, the, the, in fact, what was the task of the procurator? What was the relationship between the procurator is someone that appoints the high priest? The high priest was an appointee of Rome. So, of course, Caiaphas is concerned with, uh, with doing the bidding of the Roman government. Thank you so much, Rabbi Jack. I thought it was really so inspiring to learn about uh, what you were saying at the beginning of your uh, of your talk about the difference between seers and prophets. And I was just struggling a little bit, thinking about because I, I think it's really understandable when you talk uh, about the role of the prophet, like almost pleading to the people so that people might uh, might change it's very it's very i would say human centered right um and then when i was looking back at what you were saying even with with the example you gave of uh, of abraham uh of like pleading to uh, to god mm -hmm. i had a question is do you think that this change was a sort of like evolution so we started with uh, with people entering in a in a relationship with God and pleading to God, and then somehow there is this evolution towards okay, we have to plead to people because God is already somehow listening. Or is this um, is this dimension of being a seer maybe uh, going to be so fruitful because of this one to one relationship with God? I don't know if the, I, I, yeah, that's a wonderful question, uh, Elena. I think it has a lot to do with the question of monotheism. And that in itself is a debated issue. Uh, Kaufman, Yecheskel Kaufman, is probably the foremost biblical scholar, Jewish biblical scholar of our time, felt that monotheism was pretty foundational as part of the national heritage. I don't agree with that. I think that monotheism came out of a series of st steps. The first step is you have the God of Israel, just as other gods like Moab had, Chemosh, you know, and so forth. Then the God of Israel is more or greater than the other gods. Micha mocha ba'eli madonai. Who is like you, O God, among the mighty, among the deities? No one. Then the next step is that the other gods are not gods at all. You see this in Psalm 82, where Psalm 82, it's a very short psalm, where God actually stands in judgment on the other gods. And then after that, beginning with Amos and the prophets, you have this idea that God, the, the, the yud heh is the only God, there is none else. You see? And that's why the Shema, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, in my opinion, should be properly translated instead of Shema, which is the imperative here, it really means understand. Shema Yisrael. Yisrael can mean he who sees God, which is the way Philo interprets it, or Yasharel, which is the way um, 
Casuto translates it. So understand those who stand before God. yud heh vav heh is the real God. yud heh vav the living God, is our God, the living God alone. Because all other gods are really non-gods at all. It's only when you reach that stage that, and you have monotheism that you have this change. Because then this monotheistic god is primarily viewed as a moral deity. You see this in Exodus 33, 34, where Moses says, show me your essence. And God says, you can't really know my essence, but I can give you my attributes. And what are they? I am a God who is rachum, compassionate, v'chanun, gracious, erika paimen, steadfast, v'rav chesed, full of steadfast love, v'emet, and truth. For the first time you have an idea, I didn't have time to go into it, but in the published form, I'll go into it, uh, how they're saying that truth is what counts. Now, where else do you have this idea that somehow I've got to speak the truth? You see, this is a, it's a very, it's not simple, Eleanor. But that's a very debated topic. The other debated topic, as I said that up front, I'm on the side, it's a minority view, that they were categorically against sacrifices because A, there was the priests that were corrupt, and how in the world can you come into a, a relationship with God? And secondly, uh, it's not direct enough. And once you have prayer, and once you have a Jeremiah who can speak so directly, pour out his heart to God, once you have that connection, sacrifices become a very secondary thing for the prophets, you see. Okay, great. We'll close out with one more comment, one urgent one. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. First of all, thank you very much for your talk. And, and as another student said, we have been studying this area. And something that I didn't grasp properly, and I like your opinion about it, is we had a question, if the people will change their attitudes, would God accept their, their sacrifices? Well, you say, you're asking a really important question. And I can tell you what my theory is, okay? Does that mean that what I'm saying to you is true? No. In fact, I have, I've taught this for over 40 years in my classes, both at the rabbinical school and elsewhere. But I don't think that this is necessarily universally accepted. So I preface what I'm going to say to you with the qualification that it's my own personal way of looking at it, OK? You have two passages, one in Amos and the other one in Jeremiah. After he says, I hate and I despise your, your feasts and I loathe your solemn assemblies, but let justice wall up as waters and righteousness as a mighty stream. He adds another sentence which says, did you offer sacrifices unto me in the wilderness, O children of Israel? The implication is that what Amos is saying is that there weren't sacrifices to speak of. Yes, it's true that when, uh, Abra when Jacob wakes up and says, God is in this place and I did not know it, he then offers a, a sacrifice or something like that. There's the division of the sacrifice in Genesis 15. But it wasn't sacrifice, as Amos says, sacrifices morning and afternoon continually. So it was a totally different thing. Jeremiah says it more clearly and much more explicitly. In the seventh chapter, beginning with the 21st verse of Jeremiah, it says, I did not command you to offer sacrifices in the wilderness. Now, wait a minute. What do you do with Moses saying to Pharaoh, give us a three-day journey so that we can offer sacrifice? So you have one tradition that says there really wasn't any kind of really significant sacrificial structure during the wilderness experience, okay? Then you have others who say that can't be true because if you look at the five books of Moses, you've got a good deal of Leviticus, good deal of Numbers, you know, which actually deal with that, okay? Now, 
Here's my interpretation. By the way, I follow here William Robertson Smith and Wellhausen. They more or less uh, agree with this, okay? And I came to this, I discovered it in them after I came to this, okay? But I was very gratified because I think they're both outstanding biblical scholars. Here's my reconstruction. By and large, you didn't have much sacrifice in the wilderness experience. But with the construction of the temple under Solomon and the, and the building of uh, pagan temples for the wives, sacrifices went wild. You see what I'm saying? All of a sudden, they started doing all kinds of sacrifices, which had very little to do with the actual original wilderness experience that you had, if you look at the early, up to the 40th chapter of, of, of the book of Proverbs. Now, here comes the rub. Different empires rule differently. For example, when, As when Assyria in 721 destroyed the northern kingdom, okay, uh, they transposed populations. They could take a population here and put it there. You see this very clearly in 2 Kings chapter 19. Anyhow, uh, what they did is they transposed populations. That's the way they conquered. When Babylonia destroyed the southern kingdom, the way they conquered was by imposing a ruler who would take over. There was a danger there because the ruler would, could be corrupted or they could rebel against it. When Persia, here's the rub, and this is my original statement, which I haven't seen anywhere else. And when I mentioned this to my revered teacher, Ellis Rifkin, he said, you have now looked at the missing link, okay? When Persia ruled, how did Persia rule? Not only did they actually, if you look at, uh, at the, the historical books, that, that he allowed the temple in Jerusalem to be rebuilt, and all the gold, uh, uh, upper, uh, whatever they call it, you know, these vessels were brought back from Babylonia, but he even allowed the temple to Marduk to be rebuilt. Why? Because the Persians, the Persians ruled through priests. The priests took over. And when the priests took over, the sacrifices became vast. So what you had after the second uh, temple was built, sort of a compromise. Because on the one hand, you had the temple. On the other hand, you had the synagogue. Right? The synagogue does not have sacrifices. You can go, I remember when I was in Dallas, which was a large congregation, I was the rabbi there, some people came and says, well, where is the altar where you offer sacrifices? I said, we don't do it. This is a synagogue, you know. But the very fact that you had a synagogue and that the whole thing was built around the synagogue, not the temple, because the priests were really hated because the priests were simply the implementation of first the Persians, then the Greeks, and then the Romans. The very fact that the priest's vestment, the high priest's vestment that he had to, look at Josephus, Josephus is clear on this, that the high priest's vestment that he had to use to officiate, you know, I'm saying, it may be true even today, mm -hmm. that you have certain vestments mm -hmm. for certain holidays, it was in the house of the procurator. And unless the priest did exactly what the procurator said, he couldn't even officiate. So here's the point as to what you were saying. I think that what ultimately happened was that there was a kind of a blend. And, and, and the, the severe attacks on the sacrifices that you had among the prophets, beginning really with Ezekiel. And uh, Ezekiel 18 is an incredible chapter. You should read that in terms of how he gave a new idea of freedom and, and responsibility. But uh, Ezekiel refers to sacrifices in not quite as negative a way. Why? Because he recognized two things. One, he recognized that the Persians 
that the actual people who kill, who, who were going to take over, ruled through sacrifices. And secondly, he came to the conclusion that you can't get the people to agree on morality or to act morally. Let's give them something to do. Uh, I mean, there's a kind of a... I mean, uh, Ezekiel, on the one hand, is amazing. Uh, and, and I was going to quote it, but we didn't have time. Uh, but on the other hand, it's a compromise. Now, I don't think there's any question that religions continually compromise. Why do they compromise? Because they live in a political world, and the political world is a world of power, and they have to deal with the power. They can't act as if... Now, the greatness of the prophets, beginning with Amos, is that they were completely unwilling to compromise, and took tremendous risks. Um, Amos was kicked out of Bethel and sent back to Jerusalem, and he didn't know what to do, so what did he do? He wrote a book. That book changed the world. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jack, for being with us once again. And as Teresa said in the beginning, it's a friendship through knowledge, but I also think it's a friendship through faith. You, every so. time we yeah. encounter you, my faith grows. Thank so I know you. all of us are changed. We're transformed by walking with you on this journey that you have obviously spent many years doing, the richness with which you care for us. And what was left with me, one of the words I don't remember, but when you were talking about the God of deep care, I think <clears throat> you are a person of deep care. And sharing this with us, this depth of your knowledge and your faith is so motivating to all of us. I know they're all going to attack you now afterwards because there's still some questions we didn't get to, but you have inspired our hearts. You've filled them with the Word of God. You've called us to, all of us being, to greater in our morality. And maybe we can also then be slight little messengers and go out and remind our world this is the same call that all of us are called to. We need more peace. We need more justice. So once again, thank, thank, you, thank, so you. thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us thank tonight. You. Thank you. <laughs> and look forward to our next schedule. We'll be publishing very soon for the next year. Um, we thank you again for joining us this evening. And hopefully, if this is the first time here, it's not your last time. Please join us again. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>